Hi gang, Rob here. It is 23 March 2015 and you have arrived at edition 4.0 of my TKP for 2015. That is Traditional Knife Pilgrimage to Titusville, Pennsylvania. This is the second of four parts at Great Eastern Cutlery. In this second part, we're going to look at the manufacture of a Great Eastern Cutlery folding knife. And we're going to cover the beginning of the process, the issuance of the order on the factory floor, through the tanging process of a GEC knife. You'll have to watch the whole video to understand what that is. And this part of, uh, of our series is going to be conducted by William Howard, son of owner of GEC, Bill Howard. Uh, Dad calls him Billy, but I think we should stick with William because I think he prefers that. And he is a gracious and enthusiastic tour guide. You can tell he is really sold out for what GEC does, and they do some pretty special stuff. So stay tuned. I will get out of the way, and I'll be back at the end of the video. Enjoy. Okay, guys, with us now we have William Howard, GEC owner, Bill Howard's son. And William, what do you do for Great Eastern Cutlery? Whatever Dad wants? Uh, quite a bit. Um, I supervise a section of the shop down here, uh, our grinding operations, and run a lot of the other machinery that you see here. I work in some of the other areas as needed when people uh, are gone. And do a lot of work on the computer. Uh, all that stuff you see posted on the social media sites. That's you. That's me. The, I fix the website or when the computers, whenever there's a problem with those things. So, a all over the place. I'm getting the feeling that pretty much everybody who works here does whatever needs to be done whenever it needs to be done. Yeah. yeah. That's a good thing. So you're going to give us a shop tour. Sure. With, uh, full of all kinds of knife geeky stuff that you can only see here. Do my best yeah. all right well let's go do that so down here this is our press area that you're looking at uh, this is where we start out with all of our raw materials uh, so Matt uh, he runs this area for us and we start by giving him a cutting order and the cutting order basically tells him what knife we're gonna make so the pattern uh, what type of bolsters are going on that pattern, uh, the number of blades that are going in it, the type of blades that are going in it, and how many we're going to cut, and the type of material. So whether the blades are going to be stainless or carbon, or whether the bolsters will be nickel silver or steel, so on and so forth. Uh, so he starts out with, say, our blades. And you can see this is uh, an example of some traditional style blades there. Uh, what he'll do with when he starts to work with the blades is he grabs his punch die. So you can see there's a table here in the middle. If you kind of stand up to the side, you can see it's full of dies. Uh, so uh, the majority of the parts that we're making here are bolsters, our blades, our scales. All these are require several dies to make, and we do almost all of our die work here. Uh, we have an EDM machine and Bill, the owner, does all the designing of the patterns. Most of those designs are based off of uh, old patterns or old designs, so we look at a lot of old cutlery uh, catalogs for inspiration. And uh, so, as I mentioned, we make all these dies here. That's one of the reasons we're able to make such a wide variety of patterns and variations on those patterns is because we do all that work in-house. So Matt will start by taking his uh, die for whatever blade we happen to be running and he will load it into his press over here on the left. And a uh, punch die is just basically exactly what it sounds, it's punching out parts. So uh, he takes his sheet of steel, whatever thickness it happens to be that we, wa we want the blade to be. He cuts it down into a uh, width that's about the same width as the uh, length of the blade and a, a strip of it and then he passes it through the press and he's operating that with his foot and the die comes down and it's just blanking out parts. 
So you mentioned the EDM machine. For guys who don't know, what is that? Uh, it's a wire cutting machine. So it uses uh, a wire, uh, brass wire, I believe, as it is, and it works similar to like a CNC in that it it moves that wire along and cuts out uh, our dies, basically. It follows a pre-programmed path. So after the after the presses punch it punch out the components, then what? Well, you can see here. One thing I'll point out is uh, <clears throat> the light's not very good here, yeah. but our parts have these little uh, nubs that you see here. One on the point, uh, one here up on the corner of the tang. Those are called point protectors, and those. Uh, are there so, because those are areas of the blade that we want to uh, either have a, a very specific finish or in the case of this we want it to have a nice uh, sharp point uh, when we're all done. So, so that's a spear point blade. Yep. <clears throat> so when the parts are punched out on a press, if these point protectors weren't here, uh, those crisp edges would be what I call run over so they'd be rounded over as they're pushed down through that die gotcha okay so that's why those are on there so the tip of most GEC knives almost all of them that's actually formed at, at final sharpening or is that done when they're grinding the main profile there, of the that's blade? done after they're ground and that point is then shaped by hand at the, at the very you know we do it as far into the processes as possible. That's why we have very crisp points on our blades. They don't look rounded over or polished over on the ends. We do appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, now down here, Matt would also uh, work with our bolsters. So he would use the same press, the same operation uh, down here to punch out bolsters. And so you can see here uh, the first operation, we're just blanking out a uh, part. In this case, these are all uh, nickel silver here. And uh, we're just starting out by basically punching out a, a piece that is a particular thickness and a particular shape and size. Uh, so you can see that's what it looks like. And then what we do is called coining. So we take this part and uh, most often we heat it up and then it's loaded into a forming die and that forming die is a it's hollow and it's a basically a negative of the shape that we want the bolster mm -hmm. to be so uh, for example on my knife I have my pocket here this bolster has a, a line in it and a dimple and so in our forming die you would see that over in, here so that light's hitting yep. us right. Okay. You would see that in opposite. So you'd see this line raised in the forming die and this dimple raised in the forming die. <clears throat> and so when that bolster is loaded in there, the press comes down and it's basically smashing it, pushing it into that forming die to take the shape of the die. Okay. At the same time here, when these uh, bolsters are being formed, you can see on the back there's a there's a pin here. Uh, this pin is called a Tommy pin, and this is formed at the same time that the face of the bolster is formed. Okay. Okay. This pin is uh, what we use to attach our bolster to our scale material. So um, the, the brass liner in my knife, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we use to attach it to. I'm with you. Okay. I'm going to put this back. So, I just mentioned the scale. Uh, most often in our traditional knives, we use brass for our scale material. Uh, sometimes we use steel or nickel silver. But most often it's brass. And the steel would be most recognized in the Tom's Choice Parlors. Yeah. Which a lot of guys didn't know that, but that, that whole knife's steel. There's no nickel silver in it, maybe except uh, the, the liners. Uh, the bolster is all carbon steel. Right. Yep. Uh, we have a couple other knives 
that are all steel. Most of them are, are listed. You see the last three. Well, at the end of the serial number, you see STL. Right. That means all steel knife. So I think like our number 68 Pony Jack was an all steel knife. It's a very similar knife to the boys' knife. It doesn't get as much love as it probably should. It's a nice knife. So that's probably a knife that can still be found. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe. It's a it's a cigar frame equal end. It's about the same length as the boys' knife. Same style. It's a jack knife, clipped in a pen blade. So that might be worth another look as we're browsing through websites looking for GEC products. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in regards to the scales. What Matt does down here is he, he, he takes the, the brass in a similar manner to the steel and he's cutting it down into a, a usable length. And he comes down below us here. There's a very small press. You might not be able to pick up down below us. Oh, look right underneath us. Yep. And down there he he's punching out these rectangles that you see here. So Cutting them out in this, this length is about the length of the knife that you see. And then these two holes are also punched into it at the same time. These are where we're going to attach our bolsters. So the parts then come over here. You see these two uh, small presses here, I call them air rams. They, they take uh, the bolster and they load it back into a forming die. So if you look real close, you can see a forming die at the bottom of that ram. So this near one? Yep. And they take a bolster and they lay it upside down in that forming die so the Tommy pin is sticking up. They would then lay the scale over the pin and that ram comes down and smashes the back of that pin. It's called tomming on a bolster. So that pin is actually riveted essentially. The, the bolster is then riveted to the scale. So that so now we have that the second right, so step down. This is what you see here. This uh, pattern that we're looking here is a 73 pattern. It has a bolster and an end cap. And these are attached the exact same way. So they use the first press here to attach the bolster. They would then come over onto the second press and they would load in their end cap and attach it the same way. And then, third step down is starting to look like the shape of the knife. Sure. So they would then take this and they would come over here to the screen hooded, I believe it's green press. And in there they have what's called a trim die. So the scale would get laid upside down in there. And the trim die comes down and punches out the scale and removes all the excess brass and nickel silver on the outside edge of that handle. See what it looks like here. Yep. Now there's still a little bit of excess uh, nickel silver here in the middle. That would be milled uh, and removed later on in our fabrication room to give us this nice uh, crisp surface here. Gotcha. So um, then the, the bottom one. Yes, the bottom one is our last operation here. The scale would get loaded into our next press, and then there's That's the one with the orange hood. Yep. And there is a marking plate, the series of pins. And those pins uh, are different, of course, depending on the pattern. So in this case, uh, these pins will come down, and you'll see they've punched out four holes in our scale. This is our center pin hole. See on my knife, that's my center pin right there. Yep. So that's what the that's the center of the back spring. Yes, this pin will go through the knife, through the back springs, and come out the other side here. And then you have these three holes here. This is where we'll uh, rivet a handle material onto this knife. And then finally, you see these two pilot holes are started on the bolsters. So when this is done, it'll go into our fab room, and they will drill this out and uh, a pin will eventually go through there as well. So, you can see. so obviously the one in the bolster is for the pivot? Uh, it depends on the knife. Um, so the knife I have has blades that come from both ends of the knife, so the both ends will be pivots. Right. This particular knife 
Our bolster end is our pivot, so this would go through the tang. A pin would go through here, through the tang of the blade or blades, and this would just go through the springs. Okay. Gotcha. So that would, and the one in the in the end cap that restrains the back of the back spring. Yeah, I'll show you a spring over here okay. actually. Um, as the blade opens, it, it walks across this part of the spring here. And uh, it's just basically pushing or bending the spring out of the way as it opens and closes. And uh, it's the tension of the spring against the blade that gives you the snap of the knife. And there are actually two points on that tang that contact the spring, right, when it's closed? Say that you have, like, you have some, you have the kick and then the back corner of the the spring? Uh, when it's in the closed position, it's really... So it's uh, just riding on the kick when it's closed. For the most part, yeah. So that, that, that forward point on the kick determines how deeply the knife sits into the frame. Yeah, yeah, so, and that's something that you can adjust yourself. Um, <clears throat> when we make our knives, we always make them with more kick than we need. So you'll see when we're going through and the knives are assembled, you actually see the blade is, is riding high and the knife uh, throughout much of the production. And it's uh, adjusted a couple times over here in the assembly and finally before it goes into the tube to make sure that the point is sitting just below. And as you use your knife and as you sharpen it, you can then adjust that kick to keep your point down below the... So if you've sharpened a lot of your blade away, you may want to take a little material off that kick so you the yeah. point doesn't get you when you're fishing your knife yeah. out of your pocket. Gotcha. Uh, let's take a step back for a second. Okay. After the blades are punched out, and actually you can see Matt down there now, he's punching out parts. There is. And, There's uh, Matt. Yep. I'm not sure what exactly he's working on right now. It looks like blades. But after he's punched them out, they go into our fabrication room, which is the room down below. And in there, uh, they do a number of operations on the blades while they're still soft. So they have to drill a hole in the tang of the blade. You can see there. Uh, they also put our, <coughs> excuse me, they put our branding into the, the tang of the blade, our serial number. <coughs> or whoever's branding or whoever's knife we're making. And then they also do our nail nicks in there. These are ground into the blades. We also do long pulls in our blades, which I, I don't have one here to show you, but the long pull is a bar, basically, that's in the blade that you use to open the knife. There you go, so it's featured on our very popular Barlow's. <coughs> and, uh, this long pole is done down here on our presses. This is actually stamped down here on our large press into the blade using a, what looks kind of like a wedge. And uh, this is the old way of doing it. I'm not sure how I'm, people do it now. I imagine they maybe grind it out of the blade. Uh, but this is actually punched into the blade. Uh, the reason why it's difficult to do is because when you punch that long pole into the blade, it actually deforms the back I of the blade. It does. And you have a big bubble that sticks out of the back of the blade. And you then have to regrind your back and to, to get it back to its original line and shape. And, I, and I, it just causes a little bit more hassle, but that's the way we do it here. It's so nice if you were grinding, if you were grinding, you wouldn't have that deformation. Yes. But it wouldn't probably look the same? Uh, if you're familiar with them, you could, you could look at a knife and tell whether it was punched in or ground into it. But it would look pretty similar. Right, okay. Um, so all of that is done to these blades while they're soft, okay? Uh, the blades... The blades we want to be very hard, right? Because that hardness is what 
uh, helps with edge retention. So uh, you want to have a nice edge on your knife and you want it to last a long time. That's what that hardness does for you. Um, one thing I want to talk about while we're, we're on this though is that the, the harder you make the steel, obviously, the more brittle it gets. Right. So what we do uh, when we get our blades back from heat treat is a process down here, we call it tanging, but uh, it's really annealing. So we have a machine down here, this blue box that you see. So and that's like a mini furnace? Well, it's an induction. Okay. Uh, it uses water and it goes through that coil. There's two layers of the coil that sticks out and as the metal passes between those two coils, it's heated up. Okay. okay. What we're doing here, you can see a box of blades on, on the table there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is you can see how they're all black. This blade that I have in my hand is black. This is a, a blade that's been heat treated. Um, when the carbon steel comes back from heat treat, it's, it often looks like this. It's very rough most of the time. Uh, and that's uh, the carbon that's coming out of the steel when it's being heat treated. So, and of course our customers know what that looks like because they buy Northwoods knives. Yes, yes. Yeah. We leave some of that scale material, that some people call it, on the blades. Um, so what we're doing down here is we are annealing the tangs of our blades. So we take a blade and we load it into that carousel you see there. And that uh, allows the blade to stick out only a certain distance out right. of that carousel and then a blade spin around into that coil and they're heated up to a particular setting on that and what's happening is the tang of the blade is then being heated up very quickly uh, depending on the thickness of the blade or the size of the blade we're, we're heating it up to a certain range and what that's doing is softening the tang okay? what that does for us is a number of things one well first off uh, you can see on a finished knife here, this is my shoulder. This is where I've ground into the blade to start my edge. And this is typically the weakest part of your knife. Okay, so if I... Because uh, you've created a sharp corner, several sharp corners converging. Sure, and it's... It, it, it's yes. It, so if I uh, use or put too much force on this blade or if it's twisted somehow, if I use it as a improperly as some other tool. No one would ever do that. <laughs> and it breaks, chances are it's going to break here because this is its weak point. Right. So... Because it's too brittle. Right, the, the hard steel is brittle, right? So when you anneal it, you're so, basically taking it back to its green hardness. Uh, or pretty it's, close. It's made slightly softer, right? So that the area of the tang and the shoulder it has a slightly softer hardness and that is actually adding strength to the knife. So rather than wanting to break or snap, that would give a little and bend a little for right. you rather than just having the blade break on you. And it's relieving some stress as well. Sure. From uh, the machining and heat treating process. Uh, and what, it also allows us to do a number of other processes later on, like kinking the blade uh, that we wouldn't be able to do if we hadn't the tang. So kinking a blade like for a Congress or a Stockman knives that need to bend to go together? Right, so uh, we'll show you later on in the tour how that works, but oftentimes we have to make minor adjustments so on our blades. On a single bladed knife or a jack knife, we like our blades to be perfectly centered. Uh, if we didn't anneal the tangs, we couldn't kink the tangs to center our blades. When we grind them, we're, we're grinding them as close as possible, but oftentimes you need that slight adjustment, and that's what that does for gotcha. us. Okay. Another thing that annealing the tangs does for us is that it gets the tang, the hardness of the tang, closer to the hardness of the spring. So, uh, what that does is it, it prevents the tang of the blade from grinding into the spring basically or wearing the spring away so since the two are closer in hardness they they won't wear each other as quickly uh, the, the spring 
when it comes back from heat treat, it is already, it's the hardness we want it to. We're not doing any annealing or anything like that. Um, it goes right into our fabrication room, which is again a room down below here. Um, and they're going to do some pretty important operations to these down there. The most noticeable one you see is the polishing that's done here. And that's so when you look down inside your knife, you don't see that black. And you guys do that better than anyone. Uh, one of the main things they're working on though is the blade walk and the run up here. So the blade walk, as I mentioned, is the area where the tang uh, moves across the spring, the walks across the spring here. And the run up here is the end of the spring where the the back of the blade stops on it. Okay. So this determines how your blade sits the line across your knife. Uh, and the blade walk determines how your spring is going to sit in the open and closed and half stop position. So uh, if you look at our knives, you see that they have nice flush springs in the open and closed position. Here. So that's uh, done by dressing this blade walk. Okay, so what they're doing is they're taking this, these springs are, are actually uh, thicker than we need them to be when we water jet them out. And they're grinding a small amount off of this spring. And then they'll assemble a knife. <coughs> Excuse me and they're looking at it in the open and closed position. This also slightly affects the, the pull of the knife. Okay? The more material you have on your spring, the harder it is to open and close, right? But they're basically grinding a, a couple thousandths off, checking the knife, grinding a couple more until they determine what depth they need to grind these to. And then they'll grind the rest of the run that way. Gotcha. Okay. And they're also doing the same thing with the end of the spring here. So they're grinding this to a certain uh, length, and that again will determine you know, how our blade sits in the open position. So you can see the corner of my blade here sitting against my spring. Right. And that can be kind of fine-tuned later on as well, but we want our knives to have a nice, you know, nice flow to them. We don't want a knife that looks like that. So that's going to determine really the angle at which the blade comes out of the handle when yeah. it's open. Gotcha. Sure. So if you ground that too short, it'd be sticking up in the air. And yeah. If you gr didn't grind it enough, it'd be pointed down. Right, right. Uh, so when they're done with all that, the, the springs then get sent up to our assembly and they're waiting for the blades, essentially. The blades, once they come off of our annealer down here, they come over to our grinding area. Gotcha. You see, now you know what tanging is. <laughs> All right, we are getting there. Uh, the first two parts of our GEC series are in the book. Uh, stay tuned for the next video. That's going to be take TKP 5.0, part three of the GEC subset. That will cover blade grinding through assembly of a traditional Great Eastern Cutlery pocket knife. Stay tuned for that. Should be here in a day or two. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great day.